So this talk is about the fictitious divisions that we invent and how I think they harm the progress of our industry. Uh, so, you know, in this talk, I want to explore one particular fictitious division, which is the tension between object-oriented programming and functional programming, um, and make an argument for why and how I think we should do better. So, functional programming is really cool. I love it. Um, it's a powerful technique, and it's getting very popular, you know, the, these days, uh, after quite a long time lurking in the shadows, and I think that's a great thing, but I also believe that mainstream wide-spectrum languages like Java or like C-sharp for example, have even more to offer us uh, in terms of using functional techniques for confronting real-world problems than do some of the purely functional languages. Uh, and uh, th 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 there's an old quote from a famous bank robber, Willie Sutton. Uh, when they asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, well, that's where the money is. And so from my perspective, mainstream languages are where the programmers are. Uh, and if we want to teach people to be more effective programmers, that's where we have to start. So now some people might say, you know, I'm not qualified to give this talk because Java is primarily an object-oriented language and I'm a Java guy. And, but that's fine. We all know that developers often have strong opinions on things that they don't know anything about. So I, I ask you to indulge me uh, for a few minutes while I do some of the same. So the first topic that I'm going to talk about, about which I know nothing, I mean, and really nothing, is um, sports. Uh, and in particular, let's talk about sports rivalries. So in, in the United States, one of the biggest such rivalries is that between uh, the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. And uh, sports rivalries are important. Every sports team needs a rival team, you know, and the fans, they love their team, but they love to hate the rival team even more, right? So imagine a typical New York Yankees fan and a typical Boston Red Sox fan. And, you know, these two guys actually have quite a lot in common, right? Um, so, I mean, we can put this in sort of object-oriented modeling terms, right? They're both people. They both share all the behaviors that people share, and they're both sports fans, so, you know, they, they do the things that sports fans like to do. Um, and, you know, they, they like to, to drink beer and, and uh, you know, do the wave and spout statistical gibberish and paint their face and all of that. Um, and, you know, so, and, and they certainly both hate the other guy, but, so here's the funny part, right? From the outside, aren't they really the same guy? Right, they, you know, it's only when you're in this little bubble of sports rivalries that you can actually see their differences. Um, and this phenomenon where we're so focused on differences that we miss the overwhelming commonality is, um, you know, is a staple of the geek entertainment canon. Uh, so for example, we all know that Star Trek episode where the crew en encounters the race of humanoids that are half black and half white, and some of them are black on the left and some of them are, are black on the right, and you know, they're locked in a bitter civil war, they hate each other, they've been trying to kill each other for thousands of years, there's only two of them left alive and all they can think about is killing each other, right? And from the outside, everyone looks at them and says, but you're both the same, right? Um, but of course, they, all they could see was how they were complete opposites. And all right, so the social message here was about as subtle as a hammer blow. Uh, but, you know, we play this game out almost every day, right? So imagine what we look like to normal people, to our, you know, husbands or wives or, 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 or friends when we're arguing about spaces versus tabs, or maybe text editors. Um, you know, fr from the outside, the spaces advocate and the tabs advocate are basically indistinguishable, right? They're just both opinionated geeks. And yet they're ready to kill each other, not only over code, but over a completely non-functional aspect of coding. And meanwhile, any normal person watching this play out is gonna say, you know, if these two could get over their dumb argument and, and start to work together, then maybe my phone could talk to my car, and that would be really cool. So this brings me to another subject about which I know nothing, which is cultural anthropology. Um, when, when the team wins, what do they say? They say, we won, right? Now, of course, they had absolutely nothing to do with the actual winning. They were just there to watch. Uh, but you know, this plays into the way we're naturally wired, which is to form tribes. And tribal identity has a sensible evolutionary basis, right? It's a natural defense against uh, starvation or being eaten by tigers. And all right, there aren't so many tigers roaming the streets of Barcelona these days, but our, our brains haven't uh, caught up with the fact that our environment has changed and we're still wired the same way. 
Now, tribalism isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, within a tribe, you know, people learn from each other, help each other, collaborate. That's all you know, good stuff. But it's a very short hop from let's help the members of my tribe to let's demonize the members of the other tribe. And you know, rather than asking, well, what could we learn from the other tribe? And I'm sad to say that as programmers, we're just really bad about this, right? I mean, we're, we're really, really bad about this. Uh, we're constantly defining our identities as Python programmers or C-sharp programmers or functional programmers, and then we have these unconstructive arguments about why the others are wrong or foolish for preferring their primitive tools. You know, I mean, th think about the things the programmers say about other language communities. Um, they're always the most trivial things, right? Like when somebody is complaining about Python, what do they complain about? Significant white space, the most trivial aspect of the language, right? But that's the character that we create. If they're complaining about Lisp, what do they complain about? Parentheses. If they're complaining about Java, semicolons, right? So we create these trivial caricatures in our minds of these other languages to avoid asking ourselves the more serious questions like, what could we learn from these other languages? So as programmers, my claim is we all have so much to learn about building correct, robust, maintainable, secure, easy to use, cost-effective software that we should kind of be ashamed. And certainly we shouldn't be criticizing each other about spaces or tabs or VI or static types or objects or actors or any of that. Because the user doesn't care what language you know, the code was written in. They don't care if it was written in Haskell or Visual COBOL. They just want their phone to talk to their car. And that's actually a pretty reasonable thing for them to want. So the tribal division that I'm going to talk about today is functional versus object-oriented programming. It could just as easily be static versus dynamic typing or managed versus native or any number of other fictitious uh, divisions that we can invent. But these days, you know, FP is popular and not surprisingly, it's also gotten pretty popular to criticize objects. So it's easy to find blogs or conference talks, like you've seen some at this conference today, um, that criticize, you know, criticize OO and, and, and talk about how OO has failed to live up to its promises. Well, okay, so that's totally true. It has failed up to live its promises. But let's be realistic. Has there ever been a programming technology that has lived up to its promises? You know, like, like the sports fans, you know, we want the game to have a winner, and we want it to be our team, but in the real world, there's a reason that there's a diversity of languages and paradigms out there. And sure, object orientation can be done badly, and surely there are plenty of examples of that to be found, but that doesn't mean that we have nothing to learn from it. So, you know, while some of these rants, you know, have a point, I, I want you to be able to see that there's a false dichotomy here. All of these arguments rest on, if my tribe is right, the other tribe has to be wrong. But OO doesn't have to be wrong for FP to be right. We all have things that we can learn from both of them. And that brings me to the main theme of my talk today, which is rather than investing so much and thinking of ourselves as Python programmers or functional programmers or Turing machine programmers, we should care more about being better programmers. Because we all have so much to learn. I certainly have so much to learn. We should seek to learn as much as we can from as many paradigms as we can. And to become better programmers, what we should all do is we should all learn classical FP. We should all learn classical object orientation and then strive to rise above them both. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Languages and paradigms are tools and no tool is gonna be perfect for every job. Uh, the French philosopher Emile Chartier once said, nothing is more dangerous than an idea when it's the only idea you have. If we only have one paradigm, we're going to use it when it doesn't fit. We're going to try to distort the problem um, you know, so, 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 that, so that it fits into our idea. But a programmer who might, who's skilled in multiple paradigms is far more likely to find the right solution to, to any given problem than one who only knows one paradigm, regardless of what language they're programming in. And the right solution might not be pure OO or pure FP or pure anything. It's, you know, it's going to be a blend. It almost has to be, you know, because most of these uh, programming paradigms aren't even intrinsically complete. For example, pure functional programming has no notion of computational resources like memory or threads or file handles. But surely these are important considerations in real world programming. So, you know, we have to lean on all the paradigms that we have in order to solve the problems that are in front of us. So, okay, um, it's easy to criticize object orientation. Some of it is well-deserved, some of it isn't. Uh, now, 
object orientation arrived on the scene under tremendously inflated claims and expectations. Um, and by around 1990, which is probably, how many people here were not yet programming in 1990? How many people were not yet breathing in 1990? Okay, so there's a little bit of a history lesson here. Um, you know, by 1990, uh, the hype surrounding object orientation had reached ridiculous proportions. Um, and, you know, it's not that OO was wrong, it's just that it couldn't possibly live up to the hype that we had for it when we thought it was gonna solve all the world's problems, right? And most of the object-oriented code out there is what I would call Sorcerer's Apprentice OO. It takes, you know, sensible, reasonable OO principles and then applies them to their ridiculous extreme. So for example, encapsulation, that's a good tool, right? So let's use it everywhere. Let's put encapsulation at every boundary, right? Put a lock on your front door and like, a lock on your bedroom door and your bathroom door and your closet door and on your shoes too, right, just in case. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how a lot of people think about object-oriented programming, right? That, you know, you want to have a boundary everywhere, you want to enforce the boundary, but you need to think about who am I protecting from and what am I protecting them from? Um, and, you know, it's not uncommon, uh, you know, to make matters worse, that we often draw these boundaries in our programs before we have even a clear design, right? And that kind of leads to the equivalent of having a bank vault door on, on every closet and sometimes down the middle of the hallway. Now, okay, so this isn't what OO is about, even though it's what comes to mind for a lot of people. And in, in some sense, we did this to ourselves, right? One of the worst offenders uh, in this is the, uh, the Java Beans um, naming conventions uh, and structuring conventions. What were these designed for? These were not designed for uh, general domain objects and business objects. These were designed for dynamically discoverable visual components in an interactive editor. Right, so you know, you were, you had like a GUI builder where you were dragging and dropping buttons and such onto a canvas, which is a perfect application, uh, you know, for objects. But the reality is, the cost and benefit of any te um, any technique is contextual, right? The lessons we learn in one sphere or at one scale don't necessarily apply everywhere. But you know, the Learn Java in 21 Days books told us to apply these uh, these techniques everywhere, and so we did. And the result was kind of the worst of both worlds, right? All the ceremonial overhead and friction, and none of the actual abstractive value. So when people think they're criticizing OO, really what they're criticizing is a cartoon exaggeration of OO. Uh, the conventions that might have been right for a graphical component framework might be downright silly for a banking application, but that doesn't mean the technique itself is silly. So, okay, I understand it's fun to criticize things that are popular, and certainly it can be therapeutic, uh, but, you know, beyond a certain point, all this does is make us worse programmers because it closes us off to what we can learn. So, okay, if that's not classical OO, what is? Well, all right, let's step back a little bit from the details of, you know, the, what you, you know, the, the OO languages you might have in mind, like C Sharp or Java or, or, um, or C++. Uh, Alan Kay, you know, once said, I made up the term object-oriented, and I can tell you I did not have C++ in mind. And you could substitute Java there just, just as well, just Java hadn't been invented yet. Um, most popular OO languages today emphasize inheritance, but, Class-based inheritance is not essential to OO. Uh, it's just one way to get polymorphism. Similarly, static typing is not essential to OO. Smalltalk was dynamically typed. The essence of OO is that computation proceeds by objects sending messages to each other. And those messages don't have to be statically typed or synchronous or even local. You send a message to an object and it does something. Maybe it performs a side effect. Maybe it performs a computation and sends you a message back. Um, but th this mechanism of structuring uh, computation by message passing gives us polymorphism because the target is free to respond to the message in any way that meets the specification for what that message is supposed to mean. And whether this polymorphism comes from classes or from prototypes or from nasty stateful logic, that's just a matter of bookkeeping, right? But, you know, complex systems do generally need some form of dynamic dispatch and typical OO languages make this pretty easy to reason about. So in OO, state is owned by objects. To access that object state, you send it a message and it sends you a message back, um, which kind of brings us to the other major contribution of classical OO, which is encapsulation. 
OO languages give developers a straightforward way to say, only this code can access this state. Now, before, we, um, before OO was popular, the, the dominant paradigm was procedural. And in the procedural world, one of the big impediments to programs growing bigger than a certain size was reasoning about program state, because all of the state was effectively global. Um, so if all of the code in your program can access a variable, then in order to reason about what possible states that variable can be in, you ha or, you know, to, uh, or, or to be able to refactor its representation, you have to analyze your whole program. And that puts a limit on how much your uh, program can grow. Encapsulation lets us take what was a global analysis, turn it back into a local one, and that in turn frees us to build bigger programs without getting bogged down in complexity. But it's still up to us to use these tools effectively. There are times when encapsulation is a lifesaver for managing complexity and security, and there are times when it just gets in the way. And as professional programmers, we're gonna encounter both of these situations, and we have to be able to know how to tell them apart and how to deal with them. So similarly, if you ask people, what is the essence of functional programming? Uh, the answers that you'll get are usually things like immutability and pure functions, or maybe pure functions as first class values, or maybe function application by substitution. But in reality, few functional languages actually behave this way. Um, you know, at least, or at least behave this way all the time, and with good reason, because um, simulating state and I.O. with monads is cool, but is not actually how most people want to program. Um, and it's nearly impossible to reason about things like memory utilization uh, in non-strict languages. So most functional languages make some practical concession towards the messy real world via some direct support for I.O. and mutation. And they accept the strictness that this entails, and then we rely on programmer discipline to not use them when they can be avoided. So, okay, um, thumbnail comparison. In object orientation, computation proceeds by objects sending messages to each other. In functional programming, it proceeds by applying functions to values. Okay, makes sense. Uh, and in, in FP, a program is just a big function. Um, you know, and functions have a simple role. They transform inputs to outputs. Um, in OO, a program has a sort of uh, more lofty goal. It's a sort of an executable model of an entity. Uh, and in any given situation, either or both of these views might be useful. So, you know, you'll often hear people say that in, in object orientation, everything's an object, whereas in functional programming, everything's a function. Right? In fact, every, um, every paradigm has a, a, an obligatory everything is a summary. You know, everything is an object or a function or an actor or a peanut butter sandwich or, or whatever. And, you know, these characterizations are, like, pretty useful, like, for the first five minutes when you're learning a new paradigm. And thereafter, I think they tend to be kind of destructive. Uh, because not only isn't everything an object, in actuality, nothing is an object. Right? Nothing is a function, uh, and certainly not everything is a Java bean. So objects and functions and actors, they're just models, right? And these models are useful for helping us understand our code, but, you know, and they are understand, uh, and they're useful for understanding, you know, uh, how, we, how we plan to get to our goals and maybe our strategy for solving the problem, but we should con con be careful not to confuse them for actually representing reality. They're just models, right? And we can choose to model things with objects or actors or functions with varying degrees of fit and fidelity in the hope of managing the messy complexity of the problem. But there's this big leap from use X to model your problem to everything is an X. And that leap isn't a, isn't a very healthy one, right? So what's wrong with everything is an object? Well, two things, the object part and the everything part, right? Uh, you know, and, and we saw how OO got ahead of itself in its early days, and it was, it was kind of ugly. But functional programming purism today is no more attractive or helpful than OO purism was back in 1989. Those of you who weren't there, trust me. Um, so, okay, so we need to abstract things away from the messy real world in order to have any chance of solving them with software because the world is so full of messy accidental detail that we have to filter some of the details out to be able to make some progress. But we need to keep our eye on the goal, which is solving a problem in the real world, not a problem in software. And in order to do that well, we're going to need 
everything we can get our hands on. We may need objects and functions and actors and you know whatever else uh, you know we can we can find. So okay. Let's put this um, in functional terms. Uh, how easy it is to mistake our tools um, and our paradigms for reality, right? So in the real world, we have a problem we want to solve, like I want to make a phone call from my car. And we decide that for good or bad reasons that the easiest way to solve this is to turn it into a software problem. So we transform our problem into a set of inputs that are going to be seen by a program and a set of desired outputs. Um, and that correspond to our goal, and then we write a program to turn the inputs into the outputs, and hopefully we are done, right? So, okay, well, we all see the problem here. We wanted to solve a problem over here. This is a little bit like the old joke about uh, you lost your keys in the street, but you're looking for them in the kitchen because the light is better in the kitchen, right? Um, you know, we had this process by which we turned the real world problem into a set of abstracted requirements. And then we you know, can solve the problem using the more tractable, dom tractable domain of software. So what do we call this mapping, right? Well, let's call it F, because we're doing this functionally. Um, and, uh, and then there's a reverse mapping from the outputs to the goal. That'll be, we'll call that F inverse, right? And the big mistake is we assume that this function F is a homomorphism, right? That it preserves all the interesting structural properties of the thing on the left when it maps it to the thing on the right. Now, how many people have been through requirements gathering exercises? Do you believe that our requirements gathering process is homomorphic? Does it preserve all of the interesting properties of the real world problem that we're trying to solve? Of course it doesn't, right? Which is why we have to keep in mind that even though we're paid to write software for a living, the software is not the end unto itself. The, soft, the, the end is solving the problem that we want to uh, write, um, solve in the real world. So the danger is that you know, we could be losing valuable structural information, and the more of the mismatch there is between our chosen everything is an X paradigm and the real world problem, the more likely we'll end up with something that ticks all the boxes on the requirement sheet, but doesn't actually solve the problem. And you know, as programmers, we're of course much more comfortable working in the synthetic world of software than the messy real world. It's easy to confuse writing the program with solving the problem. Now, in our more arrogant moments, we might tell, um, tell other people that what we do is we build abstractions for a living, right? So what does abstraction mean? It's kind of a double-edged sword. If you look it up in the dictionary, you'll find a lot of definitions. It could mean reducing to an idealized form, separating away all the confounding details to reveal the essence of something. Well, that sounds pretty good. That's the kind of abstraction I'd like to be associated with. Abstract also has another meaning, difficult to understand. That's the kind of abstraction we think about when we look at other people's code, right? Um, but even the first one is, is kind of suspect. You know, different details matter at different times when you try to solve problems, right? And so by necessity, the abstractions we used in programming have to sometimes be leaky, right? So we use abstraction. Why? We use it to manage complexity. We use it to support reuse. But it's not an end unto itself. It's a tool for solving problems. We have to keep asking ourselves whether our abstractions are really serving the user or whether they're just serving us. Because again, the user doesn't care about abstractions. They just want their car to talk to their phone. So OK, I like object-oriented programming, and I like functional programming. Uh, a lot of people these days say that they're moving on from OO to FP. And for a while, it's sort of made me wonder, well, you know, if all these people are moving on and I still like OO, what does that say about me? And well, I didn't like that explanation, so I came up with another one. Um, and, you know, if you look at the kind of programming that I do, um, I have a somewhat different experience of programming than a lot of the people in this room. Most of the code that I write these days is platform libraries. And when you're writing platform libraries, you're on the other side of a boundary from your users. In fact, you're on the other side of a lot of boundaries. Maintenance boundaries, versioning boundaries, encapsulation boundaries, compilation boundaries, compatibility boundaries, security boundaries, right? You can't count on your library being co-compiled or co-evolved with its clients or its subclasses because they're in different maintenance domains. Uh, they're compiled at different times by different people in different places. 
Um, you, of course, in, a, in platform libraries, you want to hide your internals, um, not only uh, so you have the freedom to, to evolve the implementation separately, but sometimes because you have security constraints that you have to uh, enforce. So, you know, Java's secret superpower is dynamic linkage. Um, and dynamic linkage is what makes, this, it makes it easy. It makes it so easy we don't even notice that you can just sort of, um, you know, if you follow a few simple rules, you can just drop a new jar on the class path and you don't have to recompile anything. Everything just works, right? So this is one of the places where object-oriented languages really shine. OO languages provide tools for precisely defining, navigating, and defending these boundaries. And so OO is at its best where a code base spans these kinds of boundaries. The, ba you know, there are the boundaries between, say, platform and users, that's a natural one, but even artificial boundaries, um, you know, as, such as you know, within our application, they can help us manage complexity by, again, limiting the required scope of analysis down to a small region of code. And this is obviously a big deal for security, but it's also a big deal for correctness. You know, as algorithms get more complicated, you know, if you take an algorithm like uh, concurrent hash map, right, um, this is some really tricky code, and the representational invariants are really subtle, so it's kind of a good thing that clients not only don't have to, but can't, try to reason about the meaning of the representation because they're likely to get it wrong. That's a prime candidate for encapsulation. Now you might think, well, I'm writing an application, uh, not a library, not a platform. How does this help me? And the benefit there is it's more indirect, but it's no less real. Um, so you know, as we evolve the Java language, one of the things I'm always thinking about is, will this change enable expressive new libraries? Because if you make it easy for people to develop and dri distribute robust, powerful libraries, you're going to get more of them. And if you have a rich ecosystem of libraries, then applications will have more to choose from and more to build on. And you know that's not that's true of applications. It's also true of language implementers, right? So the richness of the Java library ecosystem is in part why languages like Scala and Clojure decided to target the JVM. Right? Where would Akka be without fork join pool? They, that, would been, that would have been a lot of work they would have had to reinvent, but because it's there in the platform libraries, they can just use it, and then you can just use Akka and build you know, effective reactive applications. So, okay, so speaking about boundaries, um, I want to recommend a talk uh, by Gary Bernhard, which is called, well, Boundaries. Um, and in it, he talks about how to use the benefit of OO and FP in the same system. So within a closed domain, functional Id idioms are really effective, right? Uh, they're, they're testable, they're composable, uh, value-based data and pure functions are, you know, are, are uh, really easy to reason about. And within a domain, we don't have much need for boundaries. But as we approach the parts of the system that deal with messy things like I.O., state, failure, communication, the strengths of objects start to dominate. So this diagram kind of depicts the, the, the kind of thing I'm talking about, where uh, you, the functional entities are the little circles in the middle, and the outer shell is dealing with the nastiness of state and I.O. and failure and everything that's uh, beyond our, our program. And the considerations at the boundary are totally different from the considerations inside, right? Inside, you control all the code. It gets recompiled together, it trusts each other, it's maintained by the same people. Um, you know, across boundaries, you have to think about validation, defensive copies, failure management, retries, separate compilation, versioning, security, migration, all that. Right? So these are very different considerations and call for different paradigms. So sometimes that shell is something we write. Sometimes it's part of the runtime. So this diagram could describe an Erlang actor, right? where uh, you know, within the actor code, everything is nice and pretty and clean and functional. And uh, between actors, there's a whole lot of messy stateful stuff going on, uh, message queuing and retrying and failure management. And it's easy to think of Erlang as a pure functional language because all the messy stuff is hidden in the runtime, but it's there and it's imperative. So Erlang's actors are actually a lot like classical objects. In fact, they're a lot more like K's objects than those that we find in C++ or Java. And you, know, you could make a similar argument sometimes about microservices. You know, within the service, you can get away with uh, mostly functional techniques, but at the boundaries, what are you dealing with? IO, state, failure, communication. And these things are anything but functional. So it's kind of amusing that in our desire to move beyond objects, what do we do? We keep reinventing them, just with different names. 
So a small program could be written as a single instance of this pattern here, or maybe it's more sensible to decompose it into a ne network of cooperating shells instead of one monolithic shell, you know, like this, which like looks like every Erlang program ever written, right? And when we're designing our systems, an important architectural consideration is where should we put these boundaries? Or to put it another way, what are the objects in my application? <clears throat> and I don't mean the low-level uh, implementation classes. I mean the classical OO uh, objects, the independent entities that uh, cooperate by sending messages to each other. So this is, you know, we're starting to see one of the ways in which we can rise above both OO and FP, which is use them at different granularities. Use OO to find the right places in your application to put boundaries. Use FP techniques within those boundaries. One of the big complaints about OO is that you, know, you have so many boundaries where they're not needed, but one of the things that OO has to teach FP is that sometimes putting boundaries between you and yourself is one of the best techniques we have for managing complexity. So, you know, functional programmers like to tell themselves a story that FP is this evolutionary advance over OO, right? And, and um, it's, it's certainly, you know, um, I can understand why they want to believe that, but in, in a funny way, the trend towards FP is also a step backwards in this evolutionary progression. And, you know, if you think about the conditions under which OO arose, the whole world is procedural. We had no language support for encapsulation or for dynamic dispatch. We could only simulate these things with programmer discipline and function pointers. And the result was the inevitable result, which is that clients would ultimately end up binding too tightly to the data representation, and ultimately that was a limit on how programs could scale. So, okay, FP offers us way more in the way of behavioral abstraction and reuse than the procedural languages did. Um, but when it comes to data representation, a lot of FP languages really take a step back into that procedural world. They tempt the clients to bind uh, tightly to their data representation, and ultimately this becomes a limit on how programs scale. So if you think about like the world's largest FP program and the world's largest OO program, it's not an accident that like the world's largest OO program is hundreds or thousands of times bigger than the world's largest FP program, and it's not because FP code is correspondingly more expressive. Um, a more cultural way in which this trend towards F FP might be a bit of a step backwards is how it acknowledges and deals with real world complexity. Um, Brian Marek has written a lot about OO versus FP, and in general, he has this observation, which is, if you read what people actually write about FP languages, they tend to leave the messy real-world problems out of their documentation and their examples. Uh, whereas if you read what people write about OO, these um, often tend to highlight and embrace the complexity and show how OO mechanisms um, can be used to contain real-world messiness. And my theory on why this is, is FP sings us a siren song that you know, we can make the real world as neat and tidy as mathematics. And I would love that, I'm a mathematician by training, um, but, but we can't do that, it's just not practical. We need to rise above our desire for things to be cleaner and simpler than they are and engage the complexity head on with every tool we have for the job. And once we let go of the tribal belief that one is better than the other, it, it becomes possible to get the best of both worlds. FP excels when you're dealing purely with data. And inside the functional core, it's all data. And it's all data that lives on the same side of all the boundaries. Similarly, OO focuses on mo modeling of active entities. And that excels in system components that have to mediate between the program and the messier real world. So we get to rise above them both because each offers us complexity, uh, complementary tools for managing complexity. And complexity is so definitely the name of the game here. We are awash in a sea of complexity. Some of it is inherent and some of it is accidental. And the central goal of programming language design should be to provide us with tools for managing complexity. And complexity comes in so many shapes and sizes, it's not surprising that no one paradigm is perfect for solving all of it. it it's, it's almost inevitable that we will be operating at the limits of our ability to manage complexity. Because when a better technology comes along and that allows us to build bigger systems without being overwhelmed by the complexity, what do we do? You know, we rebuild our world in this new, uh, in this new paradigm, we breathe a momentary sigh of relief, and then we immediately turn around and build bigger systems, right? Um, until again, we hit the threshold at which we're barely able to contain the complexity. 
And you know, once we remove one limiting factor, another one's going to emerge, and the cycle of hype and disappointment is going to spin again, right? And it couldn't be any other way. The economic forces are always pushing us towards building bigger and more powerful systems. So we need to focus on the tools that we have for managing complexity. And there's basically one tool that we have. It's called composition. Um, you could call it divide and conquer. You could call it you know, any number of things. But it, either way, it's the same thing. And in that big list of things that everything is not, they all claim composition, don't they? Objects compose, functions compose, actors compose. No one paradigm owns composition any more than one paradigm owns garbage collection. So OO and FP both guide us towards composition, uh, but from different directions and at different granularities. OO gives us this top-down approach, which encourages us to draw encapsulation boundaries so we can break a big problem into smaller problems that can be analyzed locally. FP sort of encourages us to build upwards, right? Start with simple building blocks and compose them into larger ones. One of them fares better with complexity in the large, but kind of gets in the way when you try to apply it in the small. The other does really well with complexity in the small, but its minimalism with respect to encapsulation and representational abstraction can constrain its ability to scale. So this false dichotomy of FP versus imperative could be compared to a, another false dichotomy, which is, should programming be more like physics or like math? Now, like I said, I'm a mathematician by training, um, so I have my own ideas, and I certainly like this comic because it um, feeds my sense of confirmation bias. But you know, a lot of functional programmers, I think, probably feel the same way, but it's really, really easy to be seduced by the math and lose sight of the fact that you're always running on a physical machine, right? And we should ignore that at our peril. Functional languages disavow any notion of resources like memory or threads or file channels. It, this makes resource management the job of the runtime. And this can be a good thing, because then we can focus on the business problem without being distracted by the bookkeeping. But sometimes it just doesn't give us the efficiency we need to solve the problem in an economically feasible way. Imperative languages come at it from the other direction. They start with the physics and they work up towards the math. This gives us finer control, but it's pretty easy to get mired in the details, right? So one of the secret weapons of functional programming is immutability, right? Immutability is great for modeling business data. It's consistently less great down at the data structure level. Most data structures are almost exclusively concerned with resource management, with which functional languages offer us zero help, right? Almost all classical data structures involve mutability. Um, because that allows cheap uh, you know, res resource reuse uh, rather than the destroy and create approach. But without mutability, what do you give up on? You give up on cheap, updatable hash tables, and that's kind of our only trick for reducing linear time problems down to constant time ones. So, you know, and, and of course, when you get down to the hardware, there's no such thing as immutable hardware, right? It's all mutable. Immutability is just this convenient illusion that we spin for ourselves. And OK, so don't get me wrong, purely functional data structures are really, really cool. But they're, they're kind of a bit of a dancing bear. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's impressive that the bear dances at all. It's not that the bear actually dances well. Um, so thinking that programming is basically math risks ignoring resource considerations. Thinking it's basically physics risks ignoring computational abstraction. So the good news is that as programmers, we get to play in this whole spectrum in between. And we should be happy about that, because we need both. And we should be comfortable in this whole space and not hide off to one side, because the light is better over there. So OK, we get it. Narrow viewpoints are bad. How do we get past these tribal perspectives? We can start by not letting our tools narrow our thinking. Uh, by avoiding having our models become our reality so that we can shift between paradigms and influences as the needs arise. So in this way, I think that pure FP languages are going to have a pretty hard time uh, competing with broad spectrum languages uh, that offer reasonable support for both paradigms. Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to stop doing FP. It just means the language isn't going to force us to do it. So we have to make a more deliberate choice. The single paradigm languages, the everything is an X language, they force us to wedge everything in one paradigm, whether that fits or not. And very often, it doesn't fit, right? I mean, most languages are built on top of something else. And sometimes, you have to drop down into the substrate, especially to implement you know, core libraries like you, know, you can't write Erlang's message passing in Erlang, or, or the IO monad in Haskell, or, or even socket input stream in Java. But 
language implementation implementers should be willing to do that, right? But we shouldn't necessarily force our users to do that. Uh, the JVM guys on my team like to say, we code in C++ so that you don't have to. Um, so when you see that the users have to drop down into the lower level, that's not a good sign. But in a narrow spectrum language, the users are often given a bad choice. Um, you know, they can either split their program across two different program models with a big inconvenient barrier down the middle, or they can do without the things that they could do in the hosted only can't do in the hosted language. In a successful broad spectrum language, you can write a lot of your platform and your application without crossing that barrier. And it's a really powerful thing that we can write high performance data structures like concurrent hash map in Java. And this means, among other things, not only will we get more of those libraries uh, than if they had to be written, uh, written in C, but that users with specialized needs can just grab this code and customize it if they need to. And abstractions like Akka can just use it. At the same time, um, OO languages like Java and C Sharp are, are adept at learning tricks that used to be the domain of functional programming. 20 years ago, it was garbage collection. Now it's lambdas, coroutines, and pattern matching. And despite their historical associations, uh, these features have um, nothing intrinsically to do with FP at all, and it turns out they fit very nicely into OO languages. Uh, in Guy Steele's Julia Kahn key keynote uh, called Lessons Learned from Fortress, he recently made the point that good ideas survive by hopping from one language to another, and it, it may not be the language that develops an idea that is the one that survives. Maybe it's uh, popularized by a, a more mainstream language, and that can be a good thing because mainstream languages are where the programmers are. So it doesn't matter what language you're working in. No one can stop you from doing functional programming in your head. We should all learn classical FP. We should all learn classical OO, and we should strive to rise above them both. So summing up, we all have so much to learn, and the problems you know, that we're trying to solve are so messy, we can't afford to ignore any of what we can learn from any paradigm or to lock ourselves into one paradigm because we like it more. So don't be a functional programmer. Don't be an object-oriented programmer. Be a better programmer. Thank you very much.